Well, hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Terry Cole Show. I am so excited that you are joining me. So let's talk about dysfunctional family systems, shall we? And that is what I'm going to be hitting today. Because what I find is that there's a lot of conversation out there in the world about dysfunctional families. As a therapist, I make an assumption that most people are from a family that has some kind of dysfunction. But what does that actually mean to the layperson? There are a few dysfunctional traits that most people seem to go, oh, okay, well, that person comes from an alcoholic family, so I understand that that's dysfunction. But there are other traits that a lot of them have been very normalized within our society where you might not be able to actually look at and understand how those things might be impacting the way that you were raised. How is that impacting, A, the way that you're raising children, but also how does that impact your self-esteem and how you see yourself in the world? And that's basically what we're going to be covering. I'm going to cover the traits in this week's episode. And then next week, I'm going to be covering dysfunctional roles in family systems. So that's more from the addicted um, version, basically. But it's really interesting to see what role do you play? So I want to start just with the thought, the mindset that a family system, the one that you grew up in, that has a very particular way of being organized. And it's not just random people thrown together. It works like an organism. The same way that a couple becomes, even though it's a dyad, it's two people, but if you're going into, let's say, marriage counseling, or if you want your relationship to work, you cooperate as a couple to make it work. So it's interdependency within a couple as opposed to too much um, independence and too much codependence, right? We want that interdependency. With family systems, because especially with when we're children, we didn't get a vote as to what we're doing, but we are getting signals all the time within that family system of what is expected of us, how we need to behave. So let's start with the first characteristic, which is abuse. So this is a very common characteristic in a dysfunctional family. And it can happen just between the spouses, but that still, of course, is secondary trauma for children who are witnessing that, right? It could also happen between siblings, even if there was no violence between the parents or there wasn't violence between a parent and the children you may have had a violent sibling or an abusive sibling. And what is abuse? Most of the time, we would consider it um, punishment for unwanted behavior. Someone who has the power to dominate you would punish you for what they would consider unwanted behavior. So that is one characteristic. And it's important that you recognize you know, a lot of times, again, people really normalize this like, oh, you know, my, my parents hit me and I'm fine, you know, and you, may, maybe I'm not saying you're not fine, but I am saying that that impacts, A, the way you think parenting should be, but it also impacts your sense of self, your value, your self-worth. There's a lot of things that go along with that. And then there's a fine line between actual corporal punishment for doing something that is wrong, that you knew was wrong, where it just because somebody would, you know, um, spank a child, you know, on the bottom over clothes, let's say, or whatever, whether I'm for that or not, I'm actually not for that myself. I'm very anti-physical anything. But, you know, that's not the same as someone's drunk father coming home and beating them up, right? We understand that those would be different things. At least there was some mindset with the first one, but all of these things have implications for us. So let's talk about the next trait, a family of addiction. Now we get this, but any addiction within um, a family system creates dysfunction for the rest of the people. So we're talking about, I don't know, at least 45% of the US population has been exposed to some kind of alcoholism or some kind of alcoholic behavior, which is a lot of people. Like, what does that translate to? Like almost 80 million people, that's a lot. And it could also be drugs, right? It doesn't just have to be alcohol or a combination of both. But parents with addiction have such a negative impact on children because the kids are always 
they, they always get parentified in that situation. The moment a parent is not in control or isn't parenting, basically, a child is now put in the position of doing what the parent should be doing. It could even, it could come as like financial problems, communication issues, right? Um, not, not a very trusting bond. There's, there's many different ways that addiction creates chaos within a family system. And the roles that I'll be talking about next week really have to do with, I've seen them in families that don't have addiction. So I'm going to talk about that as well, sort of my own discoveries. But I will also talk about the most common roles that we play when there is a person in the center of the family system and that person we call them you know they're the they're the addict or they're the dependent but how the whole entire system then organizes around them and there's all kinds of addiction my within my family system my father was very successful he retired when he was 51 to, when he was 51 years old but when did, what ended up happening was that he was a high functioning alcoholic and I didn't know that was not normal until I had a therapist confront me my senior year of college and tell me that she thought my behavior was alcoholic and that is actually when I stopped drinking many, many years ago. Um, but it's there's a lot of um, sort of covert or very hard to put your finger on addiction things as well because workaholism is one of those two. So we'll get more into those the roles that um, get established within families of that kind of dysfunction next week. But anyway, back to the addiction, that is certainly one of the traits that would constitute a dysfunctional family. Another one that may not be as um, obvious, because this is one that's very normalized within our, within our society, is perfectionism. So if you come from a family where the, the goals for you, what was expected of you was not realistic, it ends up, you know, people think it raises the bar so that you have successful kids, but it really doesn't. It raises the bar so that your kids can never sort of meet the bar. And now this creates self-image issues, self-esteem problems, because you'd never feel like you're good enough. You never feel like you're ever going to do the thing that your parents want you to do. Also, if you have parents who expect you to be perfect and there's all this pressure, it doesn't create the expansion for a child to be comforted by the parent, right? So if you did poorly on a test but and you felt terrible about it or you felt bad or you messed up because you went out instead of studying or whatever the thing is, in healthy family systems, your parents can say, I'm disappointed that you made that choice, but I love you. I still love you and let me st I will still comfort you, you know? rather than I told you so, or rather than what's wrong with you and all of those things, because the kid knows if they're gonna be supported by the parent or not. A lot of times children who grow up in this world of perfectionism are so terrified of um, letting their parents down that they, they're not close to them at all. So it really does impede actual um, intimacy. All right, and the next one we're going to talk about, the next trait, is lack of real intimacy and how easy it is um, for people to confuse intimacy with codependency, right? And they are really different things. So let's, let's talk about what it is. Um, healthy families, right? The parent is, you're teaching the children to be able to be on their own. This is, this is what we want. We want them to become self-sufficient. In an unhealthy system, if you have this uh, lack of intimacy, a lot of times you have the high co codependency, as I said, what does that mean? That means like the parents don't ever not want to be the center of the child's world. But of course that's unfair and unhealthy because if you're healthy, you want your children to create their own world where they and their partner be, are the center of that world and then their children become the center. You know what I mean? So if you're a parent and you if and you have grown kids, but you still insist that they come home for Christmas or whatever it is, you're, it's your problem <laughs> because you haven't developed a life outside of your grown children, or at least not one that is satisfying enough for you to not be pressuring them. So lack of intimacy um, 
it basically there's a lot of pressure because it's the image like the parents want the unhealthy if there's lack of intimacy the parents want to still control things the way that you did when the when your children were actually children so what ends up happening is all this resentment happens and is the, are those the people you want to spend time with no nope, not me so when you allow space when you have a, a healthy enough life on your own that you want that for your children what ends up happening is that usually there's a real like there's a real bond so they want to spend time with you because not because you're pressuring them and not because you're guilting them really because you love them enough to let them go in in a healthy way so lack of intimacy is lack of intimacy is really important knowing that codependency is in there um poor communication is in almost every <laughs> every family i feel like this dysfunction unless there are people who've done a lot of self-help work um the, so much conflict stems from really not knowing how to communicate and when to communicate so this has so much to do with and don't worry I'll, i'm going to give you some um like a little cheat sheet in the end so that you can get an idea of a figure out which one of these is you and then with with the downloaded um dysfunction blueprint that i've created for you that's the thing that you'll be able to download to be able to see what was most prevalent in the family that you grew up in because you need to identify before we can move into what are the what are the fixes for it right so poor communication which what does it mean if you can't fully express yourself if you're basically not allowed to express yourself within your home that is also a real intimacy blocker so we want to look at that like that's what's real if you if you shame a child if you guilt the crap out of a child they don't want to tell you what is going on if you can't um you just don't have that ability to speak truthfully and say what's on your mind especially if you can't disagree with sort of like the majority of the group let's say that is really important and that really blocks communication and a lot of this stuff is unspoken hence why i've created this downloadable little um um, cheat sheet for you to answer these questions because a lot of the stuff is not stuff we would normally just think about on our own right you don't sit around thinking about this but these things if they're unresolved could really be um, negatively impacting your life right now so the only reason I ever want to go back in time is if something is eluding you or if you're having something painful happen in the family that you've created for yourself a lot of times the answers to why that is is in the past so that would be for me the only reason to go back because i'm really not a big fan of like lingering in the past because why i mean unless there's a good reason to linger in the past the thing with poor communication is that it always leads to some kind of conflict or argument that this is a become can become like a daily stress type thing where if you learn to do sort of proactive communication which you can do you you don't always end up in the same argument i mean does that sound familiar to anybody watching listening does have you had the same argument with people within your family system over and over again and it could be in your your you know could be in your marriage it could be in the family you created or your family of origin but that's definitely an indication that we have to go back in time when we find, when we see these repeating realities as i would call them um, another indication of dysfunction is lack of boundaries so a lot of times we talk about family systems as open systems or closed systems so a closed system means that there's not a lot of people from the outside that can come in so within that there a lot of times there's no boundaries within that system but there's a big boundary to the outside world like lack of trusting neighbors and friends and a sort of us against the world is the mentality um but there's a lot of secrecy in closed family systems distrust for authority distrust for you know your school counselor who or whomever would be trying to call the house um parents who see their children sort of as an extension of themselves right so a lot of you know i've done a lot of work on um, talking about narcissistic parents um 
And this is really confusing to kids. And this is, this is a really blurred boundary around identity. Because when a parent a acts like you are an extension of them, it's really easy to, to not understand that you're not, because this is the way that you're raised. But of course, you are not an extension of anyone. You are a, a very um, unique, independent human on your own. But in this type of a family without boundaries, without healthy boundaries, because sometimes the boundaries are so great, there's almost no intimacy in the family. Like people barely know each other. That's possible too. I find that with closed systems, what we see is that there's a lot of merging within the people within the family. You don't even know that it's your right to have a boundary. Um, ha if you grew up feeling like you had no privacy, that is a boundary issue. If you grew up actually having no privacy, where you couldn't be on a phone call, by yourself where your your room wasn't your own that your parents felt like they could go through all your things or read your diary those are all pretty brutal boundary violations um and again what is that why do we care about all of these things oh because we tend to grow up and repeat them in our relationships which we don't want to so when you can identify the way that you grew up if you haven't done it before you could then we can connect the dots forward to what might be happening in your life right now which is really helpful because then you know where to put your time, energy, and attention. Like what actually needs help from you? Another trait of dysfunctional families is conditional love. And again, I'll speak to the, you know, narcissism has something to do with this as well. But there's a lot of, um, in manipulative family systems, this is where conditional love really comes in, where there's an expectation I mean, parents can straight up say to children, well, when you grow up, then you can take care of me and dad. Hello? Why, why would they want to do that? I mean, if you need help or you're not well, sure. But, but the expectation, and listen, this may be a very American idea. You know, I had said to my mother years ago, she's 81 years old and she's fine. She lives alone, owns her own home, drives an hour and a half to my house all the time. Like, she's fine. Um, but you know, I was thinking I only live an hour and 15 from her maybe. And I was like, oh, you know, Vic and I would like to build a little, a little house in the back, like a little cottagey thing for you. You know, if you ever want to come kind of live with us. And she was like, why would I want to come live with you when my church is here, when my friends are here, when my volunteer things are here, my sister is here, my family is, here, you know? And I was like, well, okay, I'm just saying maybe one day she's like, oh, I don't think so, but thank you. <laughs> so keep in mind, I'm very impacted by my family of origin and the way that I was raised um, in respect to this. But I can tell you that conditional love is unhealthy and that when someone within the family system is only nice to someone else when they want someone, that's another example of conditional love, you feel very manipulated by that experience. That does not feel good at all. And it does not make you want to do the thing. Um, and and uh, with mothers who are very manipulative, and this could fall into the narcissistic thing, where they're very, you know, kind to children, as you should be. But there's always a reminder that though, that you will owe her one day. Right? So I can't wait when you're grown. And maybe you can buy me the nice house that, you know, when you become a lawyer, then you can do this for me. And it's, it's super, super unhealthy. Um, and another part of the problem with conditional love and with all of these dysfunctional things is that there's a process in our development, right? So we go through a process in the teen years of separating and individuating. And I've talked about this before and I actually did, um, I did a video on this. And the thing is, if you have this dysfunction in place, the moment a kid becomes like a moody, mouthy teenager, which they're going to because usually, at least some version of that, there's got to be some rebellion because this is how they're going to separate from you and become a whole person on their own. It is. It becomes such a narcissistic injury, such a wound for someone if there's narcissism there. But even with the conditional love stuff, it's such a wound 
that instead of understanding this is a normal phase of development, and listen, you don't have to like it, but a lot of times the child, the young adult, the teenager will, will be made to feel like something is wrong with them. They are bad. So it's really important, if you don't want to do that to your kids, that you're clear that that you did not appreciate the choice. You think that was a bad choice. You're disappointed that they made that choice, not that they are inherently bad, because of course they're not, right? Obviously, and we don't wanna ever be sending that message that we think they are, even if they really mess up, because kids are gonna mess up. This is called being a teenager. And uh, the last trait that we're gonna look at is basically a fear-based home. So what creates a fear-based home? Well, this, this goes along hand in hand sort of with the abuse stuff is that a lot of times you don't know what you're gonna get. So if you're in an alcoholic home, you, you don't know if it's gonna be the good parent or the bad parent when you come home. If you have an abusive sibling, you, you don't know a lot of times if there's unpredictability, you don't know what is gonna set that person off. So it creates a hypervigilance within you which is exhausting. And then it's create, fight or flight is activated for long periods of time, which is pouring cortisol, adrenaline, and all these other hormones that are very taxing on your health uh, into your body. So that fear-based stuff, which does create a lot of empaths in this world, I can tell you, because if you're in that situation, you become incredibly skilled at reading people's feelings, thoughts, what they're doing, what's happening, what somebody needs, right? Because if you are in that system, you just want to get out of the way. You don't want to, you don't want to be the focus of somebody's rage, but you also will in a codependent way like kill yourself to get them what they need so there isn't a blow up. It's like being in an alcoholic system and what that actually looks like and what that means. Um so that's the last one is unpredictability and fear. Sometimes this comes also from a super religious upbringing. Um, so yeah, so those are the ones for you to look out for. I feel like we hit them all. Um, I'd love to hear what you think about this and if this was helpful for you to even just name them because this, this, is, this is what we're doing right now is naming them. What I'm giving you as the download is a cheat sheet where you can identify for yourself which which of these basically impacted your life. And some of you may look at it and just say, oh, I know, I had these three things or whatever. And then within the cheat sheet, I'm gonna give you a couple of ideas of things that you can do to um, heal the wounds from having this type of a dysfunctional family. And again, I think most people have some kind of dysfunction. It matters if you have eight out of eight, right? Or six out of eight. That's when there's usually more work to do. So if you found this helpful, I hope that you will share it on your social media platforms and with people that you think it may help in your life. I am um, looking forward to hearing what you have to say about this. So whether you're listening to this on the podcast, whether you're watching it on YouTube or whether you're on terrycole.com, I will be in all of those places answering your questions. So if you have any, please send them. I hope you have an amazing week diving deep into you. And as always, take care of you.